lofty peaks seeking the sky. No mighty glaciers or rushing streams wearing away the uplifted land. Here is land, tranquil in its quiet beauty, serving not as the source of water, but as the last receiver of it. To its natural abundance, we owe the spectacular plant and animal life that distinguishes this place from all others in the country. The Everglades is the largest subtropical wilderness in the United States and the only one of its kind in the world. It is the only wetland in the world that is primarily nourished from the atmosphere, not from melting ice caps or mountain streams. It provides habitat and food for 45 mammal species, 350 species of birds, a multitude of fish species, and at the same time, it provides drinking water for over 8 million people. As Lake Okeechobee overflows in the wet season, the water passes through hundreds of diverse habitats as a slow-moving shallow river running through Everglades National Park and into Florida Bay. Before there was a Florida, Native Americans inhabited the area, bringing agriculture and fishing, and lived harmoniously with the environment. Some of their descendants are members of the Miccosukee and Seminole Indian tribes today. If you can imagine being here 300 years ago, this is what was sacred. This is the Creator's creation that nobody can duplicate. Our people, the Miccosukee, um, after the, during the Seminole Wars, our people hid in the Everglades, and the Everglades provided a safe place for our people to live. It provided food, shelter. In order to create more land for construction of roads and cities, man has trained the life-giving water from Lake Okeechobee by diverting its natural flow, emptying into nearby coasts. Well, the Everglades has been changing throughout its full history. It's just that the rate of change over the last, say, 100 years or so has been so much faster than the pace of change in its uh, deeper history. And that's mainly caused by all the canals that have been put around the Everglades to divert the flow of water off the land and over to the sea. This has had an additional effect by creating an overabundance of salt water. These changes directly affect the floral and fauna balance. Eventually, it will impact all the residents of Southern Florida. The water quality needs to be improved. If Lake Okeechobee is a heart of the Everglades system, and I believe that it is, that is the way it was designed to be, that the water quality coming into the lake has to be addressed. We've got to have cleaner water, so therefore we can disperse cleaner water to the estuaries and hopefully into the Everglades. It was not until the 1970s that environmental awareness in America hit a tipping point. The formation of the Environmental Protection Agency and indisputable evidence of endangered wildlife studies began a wave of national concern and earth awareness. In as early as the 1970s and late 1960s, notices were already going out from the state that there was a lot of pollution in these waters. And so our, our people here have been impacted where we were given notices, you don't want to drink the water, eat game or, or, or do any hunting or take anything from this environment more than once a week. So we have been dealing with that since the late 60s and 70s. But now what you're seeing is not only is it the Indians, now it's everybody else who's going to be impacted. A strategy was formulated and debated for several years, eventually bringing about the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. This 30-year study was authorized by Congress in 2000 as a plan to restore, preserve, and protect the South Florida ecosystem while providing for other water-related needs of the region, including water supply and flood protection. The Everglades can shed light on dynamics that the whole world cares about and the world is watching. Everglades Restoration is the world's largest, most expensive, and in some would say most important ecological restoration project. And so the world is watching the Everglades and what happens here 
has much to tell us about the rest of the world. Over the years, many new stakeholders have emerged. Intense debates over the where and how the water is to be distributed, who is to pay for it, and who will manage the logistics of maintaining this vital resource are waged in courts to this day. It affects everybody in South Florida. You know, the tribal members, the non-tribal members, uh, the, the whole part of South Florida is affected. You know, whether, whether they accept it now or not, it will affect them in the decades to come. So what is there to do to increase public awareness and stimulate change? First thing I would ask the public to do is do their own independent research and get their own independent answers. Then, if they want to contact elected officials, I will tell you, based on my lengthy background in government, that we give as much attention to your communication as it deserves. Well, I think that the best thing that we can do right now is make sure that every time that we talk about an environmental issue, we bring back the reality of the importance of the individual in this environmental issue. Usually we tend to talk about environmental issues and we lose hope and we either blame the generation before us or we, we leave it up to the generation that is coming after. Um, and we forget that we right now as citizens we have a role and we can call our representative and we can, like we are, we can take that first step for any policy making. There are three major steps needed to begin to restore the Everglades. Water conservation, better water management, and controlled urban growth. Education is the key to communication, understanding, and appreciation of the South Florida Everglades. From the airboat rides in which people experience nature firsthand, to public forums to connect common interests and communities, citizens must have constant vigilance on issues, proposed bills, and elected officials. The world is watching as the issues surrounding the culture of water are turning global. We need to be asking ourselves, all of us, what is our relationship to this? What is our moral, ethical, and sort of shared cultural obligation when it comes to water? I think solving the Everglades and restoring the Everglades is every bit as much a social and cultural project as it is a scientific one, a political one, or a legal one. We must plan for the future to ensure that future generations will have a beautiful home in which to live.